Hi, I'm Dr. Mary Aiken. I'm a cyber psychologist and a professor of forensic cyber psychology. So what is cyber psychology? It's the study of the impact of technology on human behavior. And it's an advanced discipline within applied psychology. My specialist area is forensic cyber psychology, which is the study of harmful, um, abnormal, and criminal behavior online. And unfortunately, I'm kept very busy. So in cyber psychology, we have certain effects. For example, the online disinhibition effect. And it dictates that people do things online that they wouldn't do in the real world. And it's a really important behavioral driver. We also have the um, power of anonymity online, which can be a really good thing, but also it's a superhuman power of invisibility, which comes with great responsibility and is not always used well by humans. We have positive attributes such as altruism online, for example, uh, crowdsourced fundraising. So the basic principle is that human behavior mutates or changes online. And it's very important to understand the impact of these changes. In my work as a cyber psychologist and specifically working on the professional speaking uh, circuit, I get to speak to a broad range of sectors technology, cybersecurity, infosec, financial services, education, e-commerce, and healthcare. All of these sectors benefit from gaining insights into the impact of technology on human behavior, both from a user uh, point of view and also from an operator point of view. So I've been involved in many different research areas, for example, cyberchondria, which is a form of hypochondria manifestors online. We've all done it. You've got a headache, could be anything from eye strain to a hangover, but all, all of a sudden you start Googling symptoms and escalate to review morbid or serious content, such as a brain tumor and experience anxiety as a result. Another area of recent research is the area of cyber fraud. We've seen legislation in the UK in terms of the Online Safety Act, uh, which is specifically hoping to address cyber fraud, cyber criminal behavior around uh, fraud. And effectively, in this area, I've been, been involved in a lot of um, information campaigns, focusing on one of my core areas of expertise, which is cyber behavioral profiling. And we see lots of campaigns saying, don't click on the link, but I go further than that. I look into semantic analysis, a breakdown of, for example, phishing texts that are trying to get people to act now and look at the psychological drivers and buttons that these cyber fraud perpetrators are trying to push in order to get you to reveal uh, your personal information or details. So in terms of my talk topics, well, again, I cover a broad range of areas, everything from human factors and cybersecurity through to cyber behavioral profiling through to the psychology of AI. So first of all, let's talk about cyberspace. You know, people like me, cyber psychologists have been talking about cyberspace for about, well, about two decades now. And in fact, in 2016, NATO actually ratified cyberspace as an environment, as a domain, acknowledging that the battles of the future would take place on land, sea, air, and on computer networks. So, the US military conceptualizes cyberspace as having three layers. First of all, you have the physical network, which is the hardware, the cables, the infrastructure. The next layer is the logical network, and that actually facilitates the ability to communicate across the networks. And then you have the cyber persona layer. That's us, the humans. 
So when we think about factoring the human into the cybersecurity equation, what we have to acknowledge is that we've had 50 or 60 years of cybersecurity, and it's been very good at addressing the first two layers, that physical network and that logical network. However, we know that the vast majority of cyber attacks are facilitated by social engineering. And social engineering has got very little to do with technology and everything to do with psychology. So what we've seen is the evolution of a new sector, which broadly uh, lies under the umbrella of cybersecurity. And that sector is the online safety technology sector or safety tech. I'm one of the founder members of this sector in the UK. And our mission is to develop technology solutions to technology facilitated problem, harmful and criminal behavior. So to recap, we need to factor the human into the equation, the human from a user perspective, from an employee perspective, and also from a cyber attacker. And when we think about the range of cyber attackers, from state sponsored to state condoned, from activists to hacktivists, you know, from organized uh, cyber crime to sophisticated threat actors. We really need solutions that are robust and resilient. We want our data, systems and networks to be robust, resilient and secure. But equally, we need the humans who operate those uh, systems to be psychologically robust, resilient, safe and secure. And that's how we can deliver on 360 Resilience. So when it comes to technology such as AI, we've seen a lot of fall stones and a lot of moral panics. You know, with the introduction, say, of ChatGPT, everybody got very excited about chatbots, but chatbots, in fact, have been around for a long time. Eliza was the first uh, chatbot that was developed in the 1960s. And she was modeled on what's called Rogerian psychology, which means that she was very good at eliciting information. So if she would say to the person that she was talking to, you know, how are you? Then she would lead into another question. Tell me about your day. And the inventor of Eliza was actually horrified when 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 people who worked in the research lab started totally opening up to the chatbot and confessing all sorts of things and the program was shut down very quickly. Um, I had the pleasure of working on another chatbot, which was Jabberwacky back in the 1990s. A colleague of mine um, actually built this um, stunning technology. So the point is that what we're seeing is continuous evolutions in this area over time. When it comes to AI and the sort of moral panic about AI, um, you know, replicating human intelligence and, and rendering humans redundant, to be honest, I'm a behavioral scientist. We barely understand how the human brain works. The premise that we can build something to replicate or replace something that we don't understand is a flawed premise. So I think that what we have to do is actually understand, well, what is AI? And importantly, what can it deliver for us? And I prefer to look and to conceptualize AI, not in terms of artificial intelligence, but IA, so that's IA versus AI. And IA is based on the work of Licklider, um, a, a scientist from the 1950s who wrote a brilliant paper called Man-Computer Symbiosis. And he wrote about the symbiotic or interdependent relationship between man and machine. So IA is intelligence augmentation and it places the human at the center of the process. And I think that is the perspective that we have to have when it comes to harvesting the best from any form of machine learning or artificial uh, intelligence. 
And I think going forward, of course, there are going to be incredible changes in the space. I'm fascinated by quantum computing combined with ML and AI. And I think potentially that's the point that we might get close to mimicking human intelligence. So in terms of cyber psychology, I mean, I've been working in this area for almost two decades. In fact, I was the first person to get a full PhD in forensic cyber psychology. And you can imagine how excited I was when IARPA, which is the US intelligence research agency, sort of twinned with DARPA, which is their defense and robotics agency, when they reached out and invited me to speak at their proposers day, which was the launch of their new program, which is called Rescind, which is reimagining uh, security with cyber psychology informed defenses. And I was so excited about this uh, project because it really, you know, is a seismic sort of shift for the discipline and for the science. So IARPA were focusing on uh, what's called cognitive bias, biases and psychological vulnerabilities in cyber attackers. So essentially they were profiling or the aim of the project was to profile these vulnerabilities and then use those vulnerabilities to counter attack a sort of psychological hack back. So they were focused on areas such as decision making, judgments, heuristics and biases. And following my presentation, myself and a group of scientists, we got together for a project and we've just published our paper. And what we wanted to do was to broaden this approach. So we moved from national security and looked at industry and conceptualized potentially using this new area in terms of industry led active cyber defense. Now, what does that mean? If you are um, an organization that is a subject of a cyber attack, all you can do is defend the perimeter of your network. You cannot launch a counterattack because that would be a crime in its own right. However, the gap in the knowledge identified by ARPA, IARPA is that you could launch a psychological hack. So the premise is from a be cyber behavioral point of view is to actually um, profile the cyber attacker, and this is in an industry context, and then psychologically hack back. So what does this mean in real terms? So effectively, a research project that I've just finished, a pan-European uh, project into human and technical drivers of cybercrime, in that project, for the first time, I conceptualized the cyber crime scene in a similar way to a real world crime scene. So in a real world crime scene, you might have a body, you might have evidence of the weapon that was used, for example, gunshot wounds or stab wounds. And effectively, I transposed this to a cyber attack and conceptualized that the weapon of the cyber attacker was arguably indicative of what we call signature or cyber psychological profile of the perpetrator. So let me explain that. For example, if a perpetrator uses malware of choice and they pick, say, specifically ransomware, ransomware is highly correlated with hostage taking, which is as old as human behavior. And we know that those who engage in hostage taking can score high on a on scales associated with what's called the dark tetrad, which is a comorbid cluster of dark personality traits, Machiavellianism, uh, psychopathic traits, narcissistic traits and sadistic traits. This is not a pleasant person and effectively those who engage in hostage taking can be conceptualized as functioning uh, psychopaths. 
or functioning sadists. Now, when we think about that in terms of the malware, arguably the cyber behavioral profile or the signature of somebody who deploys ransomware puts them on that dark spectrum with psychopathic or sadistic traits. What does this mean in real terms? It means there's no point in pleading with them. Why? Because a psychopath is devoid of emotional affect. In other words, they're not going to feel guilty if you're a small business saying, look, my business is going to be destroyed, or if you're a hospital saying patients are going to die. So what you need is another uh, countermeasure in terms of psychologically hacking back. So check out my paper, I'll post a link, and the paper is titled The Enterprise Strikes Back. And if you'd like me to talk on this cutting edge topic for your next industry conference, I would be delighted to do so. So as one of the, I suppose, world's leading experts in cyber psychology, I've had the pleasure of being invited to speak at events globally, everywhere from the White House to NATO, from the UN to Interpol. And in terms of conferences, I've been invited to speak at cybersecurity, infosec, health tech, fintech, reg tech, edutech uh, conferences, policy and policing conferences. So the sheer breadth and depth of my activities point to the utility and the importance of cyber psychology in a global context. My job is equipping those who attend my talks with the tools and skill sets that they need to tackle problems that occur at that intersection of humans and technology. My job is to help people provide tech solutions to tech facilitated problem, harmful, and indeed cyber criminal behaviors. My aim from a cyber psychology perspective is to make people more knowledgeable and therefore more confident in how they approach use of technologies and in doing so get the best out of tech. And mostly my job is to actually help people to work together, all of us in this shared environment of cyberspace to create a safer and more secure environment for us all. Mm -hmm.